why don't we get started? Uh, thank you all for attending the uh, the Alan the Alan Starling Johnson Jr. Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to welcome to Duke uh, Steve, Stephen Chevelle. Uh, before I do so, it's important for us all to appreciate the generosity of the Alan Starling Johnson Jr. Fund. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, I hope I get the story right, uh, met here at Duke as undergraduates in an economics department. Uh, and the fund was set up in Mr. Johnson's memory and we thank his family for their ongoing support. They have made possible these speak, uh, this, this, this lecture series. Uh, today's speaker is Stephen Chevelle, the Samuel R. Rosenthal Professor of Law and Economics at Harvard Law School. Uh, the title of his talk was Build as uh, Fairness versus Welfare. I'm told he's going to be speaking on a number of other topics in addition to that. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Stephen Chevelle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brock. You did well. Uh, Brock's a former student of mine, uh, actually. Um, I'm going to test the, the other mic. Can I be heard in the back of the room? Okay, good. Uh, obviously, you know the, the actual title of, of my talk, uh, Law and Economics. Uh, it seems that every course I teach has those words in it. One, one course is called Economic Analysis of Law, uh, another Law and Economics. Uh, you can see I have a one-track mind. Uh, law and economics is something like, like my religion. And so uh, my, my mission here today is to describe it to you. And um, let me just indicate what the plan of action is. Uh, first, what I want to do is describe in general terms uh, what law and economics is or, or what I think it is. This will take just a minute or two. And then uh, the major part of this uh, presentation will consist of um, a series of examples, because I think the best way for you to understand and for me to communicate to you um, what law and economics is, is, is through a discussion of a variety of different examples. And in each of those examples, what I will attempt to do is uh, say how the economic analyst would, would view them, and then usually to contrast the economic view with what I will call the traditional view of uh, the legal academic or the judge or the law student or the lawyer. Uh, and, and, and in some sense, my, um, the contest that I will be uh, uh, having between the economic point of view and, and the legal, it'll be a little bit unfair because after all I'm in favor of the economic point of view and I'll just say in the beginning that, that maybe the way I characterize the other side is not quite accurate, it probably doesn't describe any single person but I think it, it will describe sort of a composite of the types of people that I meet uh, at Harvard Law School and, and elsewhere. Um, uh, okay, then at, at the end, I'll make some general observations about uh, economic analysis of law and then say something about what I think its future is. Of course, it's, it's a good future, but the question is how good and in what respects. So that's, that's my plan of action. As far as um, discussion uh, with you of what I'm doing, I, I was talking briefly with uh, Barack beforehand uh, about whether I should entertain questions during the course of the presentation or instead to try and finish my spiel at you know some appropriate number of minutes from now like 45 or 55 minutes from now and then have a discussion. We really couldn't come to a definite conclusion. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is uh, begin and and um, ask you only, only to, um, uh, well, to ask clarifying questions but not really get into the substance and then, and then probably reserve real discussion until I'm, I'm through with uh, the planned presentation. But we'll see what happens. I mean, may, maybe uh, 
well, we'll, we'll just, I'll, I'll just try and get a sense from you of, of what the best thing to do is. Okay, so uh, here's uh, overhead number three. By the way, just so you'll know how many overheads I have, there's 17 of them. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, wh what is law and economics, a, a person might ask. And <clears throat> I would say there are two major hallmarks of the approach. Uh, the first is uh, a focus on identifying how legal rules affect outcomes. So if we're talking about rules that make people liable if they cause automobile accidents, something I'll be discussing in a minute because it'll make up the first example, uh, we would be asking, well, it does the number of accidents decline because of the presence of uh, legal rules that would make you pay if you were negligent and caused an accident. Um, the second uh, feature of the approach is that once you determine how legal rules affect outcomes, you assess the uh, outcomes and, and therefore the desirability of the legal rule with regard to well-articulated criteria. In other words, you, in the world of law and economics, you typically state what your social objective is and then measure uh, the goodness or badness of outcomes against that yardstick. Now, uh, and, and what, what is usually um, considered as components of the social criterion are three items. One might loosely be called efficiency, by which I mean um, uh, producing goods and services at low cost rather than high cost, preventing accidents, not s spending less rather than more on prevention. These are what things, these are the things people commonly mean by efficiency and they are embodied in uh, the criteria that uh, law and economics folk use in judging legal rules. Second is compensation of uh, individuals who don't like to face risk, uh, which is most of us. Um, so that's a factor. And the third is administrative or transaction costs, a large component of which is what lawyers are paid. Uh, many people think too much, and that's another thing I'm, I'm going to be talking about. Um, so uh, just a, a comment is that you might be saying, well, if law and economics is, if I am defining law and economics as an approach that pays attention to the effects of legal rules, and also an approach that says when you assess legal rules, you should be careful to articulate what your measuring rod is, then what are other people doing? Because it would seem that common sense would lead everyone to be looking at the consequences of legal rules and to be careful about uh, their uh, normative evaluation of rules. Uh, and, and my answer to that question is, well, if you look at what other people, uh, namely everybody else who's in the legal academy tends to do, it's uh, in some very rough and crude sense the same as what the law and economics people do. But, uh, but that's as far as I would go because they, they tend to pay very little attention to identifying how legal rules affect consequences. It's basically a kind of lip service that they pay to that uh, factor. And, and, and you'll see this when I go through a lot of different examples that the, the attention paid by people who are not in the law and economics camp to the consequences of legal rules is, uh, is really meager. And also when you ask them how is it that they, why exactly do they favor one rule over another? It's, it's often difficult to get a straight answer. Uh, there are some answers, but um, 
the, the, one, one, one runs into a lot of um, evasion in, uh, it, when, when you press people on, on what their justifications are for different rules. So I think there's a, uh, there is a, uh, a difference between the law and economics approach and, and the other approach. But again, the best way to convince you of this and to sort of suggest to you why it's important is, is through examples. Just a word on history. Um, this Italian individual, um, Beccaria uh, and Bentham, both uh, wrote principally on uh, crime and deterrence. Bentham actually wrote on, on a fair amount more. But you, you could think of them as the, I do, as the, the people who sort of began uh, the study of what I call law and economics. But after they died, nothing much happened until uh, relatively recently, um, the 1970s, when um, Gary Becker, Ronald Coase, and um, Guido Calabrese, and uh, Richard Posner uh, began to write about uh, law, especially tort law, accident law, from um, an economic perspective. So that's just a word about the history. It's kind of odd that for such a long period of time, uh, over 100 years, essentially nothing happened. Um, OK, so now what I'm going to do is begin the series of examples. So the first example concerns car accidents. Uh, car accidents account for about half of all tort litigation Many people here probably don't know what torts are. It's kind of hard to explain in general terms, but they, they are bad things that happen to people for which um, you can sue to get damages other than uh, breaches of contract. So uh, car accidents are, are examples, explosions at oil refineries, um, you know, food poisoning, uh, bad things as I said, including being murdered. That would be a tort. Um, OK, so 50% of all tort litigation is accounted for by automobile accidents. So we're, we're talking about an important um, category of uh, uh, tort. Now, from the economic point of view, we want to know wh what are the effects of these legal rules that allow an individual harmed in an automobile accident to sue and collect money. So one effect that we would be interested in is the number of automobile accidents. You know, how many accidents are there? What, what is their severity? And so forth. There is not, surprisingly, a whole lot of study of this question. I mean, th th there is some, but not, 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 not very much. And uh, I, I would say that a fair characterization of the study that's been done is that not that is that the accident frequency does not change very much because of the presence of uh, liability rules. And if we ask, well, why is that? Why is there a relatively small effect on the number of accidents? I think the answers are pretty evident. One is that when, when people drive, they're pretty, pretty careful because if they get in an accident, there's a good chance they'll be injured. So a major incentive to be careful when you're driving is just not to be injured. Uh, another point to make is that if you are sued and you were uh, found liable, you would usually have a liability insurance policy that would pay your judgment or a substantial part of it. So to the degree that you're thinking about uh, having to pay money because of the presence of the legal system, you are insulated uh, significantly by your ownership of liability insurance. So against that background, I think intuition would say, well, if we, if we wipe out uh, the tort system if we say 
there's not going to be in North Carolina or some other jurisdiction. Um, uh, we're not going to allow people to sue if they're injured in, in, in an automobile accident. We might not expect very much of a change to occur in the number of automobile accidents. Okay. So that's one effect. Second effect is, well, what's the, uh, wh what is the influence of the presence of the liability system on compensation of people? In other words, when somebody's injured in an accident, does the fact that the tort system exists mean that they're going to get money that they otherwise wouldn't have received? And the answer to that question uh, in this domain, as I think fairly generally, is no, the, the liability system does not make very much difference to how much money people are going to get if they're in accidents. And the reason for my saying this is that most people have insurance, or maybe they say insurance down here. I know they do in uh, <laughs> close by states. Um, and so, uh, so, so in other words, if there's, if there's no uh, if you don't have an ability to sue, probably you'll, you'll get money from your insurance company. If your car's totaled or if you're injured uh, and you, you miss work or you need medical care, you're going to have insurance that will cover a lot of it. Now, it's not to say that you wouldn't get more if you sued, but it is to say that the total amount of compensation, I think most students of this question believe, is not radically affected by the existence of the tort system. So, um, so far we're talking about two influences, two types of effects of the existence of these legal rules that allow you to sue if you're injured in an accident. Um, now the third effect is transaction costs. Th these are the costs of uh, the lawyers' efforts and maybe insurance companies and so forth. What do they amount to? Well, they're extremely large. Um, I put down there, to get a dollar into the hands of a victim costs about a dollar in terms of uh, transaction costs, lawyers fees and so forth. Um, this is actually an average figure for all kinds of litigation. And if you think about it, it's, it's, it's really extraordinary because it's like you go to an ATM machine and take out $100, it's gonna, you're charged a $100 uh, fee for taking out $100. That's very, very expensive. So if the goal were to compensate people, this would be an extraordinarily expensive way to compensate people. So um, conclusion uh, might be if, if the sort of quick, stylized version of the facts that I just recited um, is, is correct. The conclusion might be that we should entertain limiting uh, liability for uh, accidents, uh, car accidents, or maybe, maybe eliminating it. And some states in, in this country have, as you undoubtedly know, no-fault um, systems, which means that if you're sued, uh, you, you, I mean, excuse me, if, if you're injured in an accident, you cannot sue. Uh, or you cannot sue unless the accident was really severe. So there's some movement in that direction. I should also mention New Zealand. New Zealand in the mid-1970s did away with the ability of people to sue for any kind of injury. And New Zealand has not become unhinged. It's not, you know, a terribly unsafe place. Uh, I haven't been there, but I have relatives uh, actually who, who live there. And it's an okay place. They kind of like it. Um, so uh, I, I think we, we can interpret what would happen in New Zealand as uh, basically an effort by uh, New Zealanders to save themselves a lot of money on uh, legal fees and so forth um, because of a uh, feeling that deterrence of bad behavior was, was, not, was not created in, it in a substantial enough way to make the system worthwhile there. Now, just one more comment about this before I contrast this, uh, the analysis of, of this example with uh, traditional, that of traditional legal scholars. Um, 
and that is that you know, if I were, if I had to make a, 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 a decision in like 20 seconds about what to do uh, about our liability system for accidents, I think uh, I would probably decide to go New Zealand's route. However, I would retain liability for trucking companies and maybe for the drivers of SUVs or big ones, you know, the navigators, the aviators, and so forth. Not, not the, you know, the, the little mini SUVs. Um, okay. Okay, so now what about um, the traditional view of uh, lawyers about automobile accidents? Well, what they think is that if somebody wrongfully harms somebody else, so a, a person negligently swerves out of lane and causes an accident, something like that, that that person should pay. It's only right that if you acted in a socially irresponsible way that you should pay. This is a, like the classical notion of corrective justice. Uh, you know, formulated by, by Aristotle. Um, so it's just correct to have people who do the wrong thing pay. So that's one very strongly held view of theirs. Um, they generally pay very little attention in this context to the question whether uh, the number of automobile accidents is falling on account of liability. It just seems to be almost irrelevant to many of them. Now, it's not irrelevant in the sense that if I go up to one of the teachers of torts at Harvard Law School and say, do you believe that it's important whether the accident frequency falls? They would, they would say yes, because how, how, how could they say no? But if you look at what they write, if you look at what they say in the classroom, um, if you ask them, should we contemplate getting rid of the tort system for automobile accidents, Many of them would, would say, no, we shouldn't really contemplate it, and they don't really talk about it very much in class. I mean, it does depend on, on the person. But um, I think my overall uh, characterization of what they think is, is correct. Now, two other comments um, about insurance. Uh, if, if you think about their view that it's only right for somebody who was found wrongly to have injured somebody else to pay for it, you're led to ask them the following question, to which I never get a satisfactory response. And that question is, OK, somebody is sued and found negligent and is asked to pay a judgment. That person doesn't pay the judgment. That person's liability insurance company pays the judgment, or a lot of it. So how does that affect your view that what we want is for the bad person to suffer, to, to feel the sting of punishment. Does it follow from your view that we should ban liability insurance, for example, because it's interfering with, with the punishment? And then another question that I, I often ask is, well, you want the victim to receive money from the bad guy. Uh, or, or as a consequence of the workings of the legal system. But what really happens if you're in an automobile accident is that you typically are compensated immediately by your insurance company. And then if there's a suit, which often takes a long time, and the other side pays you, you often don't get that money. The money goes to your insurance company to compensate it for the money that it had already paid you. So in a literal sense, a lot of the money that's going back and forth as a result of suit, it's going back and forth between insurance companies. None of this, uh, these latter comments, are taken into account by the legal folk who are pressing uh, for usually the, um, for, for keeping our, our, our system of law that governs automobile accidents. So this is an example of the very different outlook and orientation of uh, the economic uh, folk from, from the others. Okay, so that's example number one. 
Okay, another fairly general example concerns liability of firms. Uh, and here, um, I like to divide uh, accidents caused by firms into two major categories. One category is where the victim of the harm is actually a customer of the firm. So an example would be, um, well, I, I have some examples. You buy a car and uh, the brakes fail. Or uh, like Audi some years ago had a problem with sudden acceleration of their vehicles. Uh, um, there are side effects of vaccines. Uh, and obviously there's food poisoning that happens frequently. So the, the, in, in these examples, you suffer harm because you bought a product. You, know, you went to uh, Chi Chi's and you, you bought a hamburger. Uh, 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 you decide to have a flu shot and you, know, you fall over dead or something like that. It won't, it won't really happen. Uh, you should take your flu shots. Um, uh, so, okay, and then the other category, uh, although I have to say I don't take flu shots, um, it's because I don't think I'm going to get sick, actually. It's not, uh, not that I'm afraid of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the vaccine. Um, okay, so the other category of accident is where the victims don't suffer harm because they bought a product, it's just because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So an example would be you're sitting in your house and a cement truck comes through your living room, you know, just veered off the highway. Uh, or, um, well, it could be anything, an uh, oil spill uh, messes up uh, fishing in an area or, or uh, prevents people from going to the beach because it, it soils the beach so all the motel owners are harmed by that. So this is a second major category of um, accident in which firms might be um, responsible. Now, if we ask the standard question of the economist, well, what is the effect of imposing liability on firms? It's very important to distinguish these two categories of accident. And, and, and the reason is, if we think about the first category, where the victims are customers, um, it's not apparent and, and, and it's also not obvious from the, the, the actual data that exists, which again is, is scant, that liability does have very much of an effect on product safety. And, and, and the reasons are pretty intuitive that firms, especially big firms, are worried about their reputation. Uh, if they sell a product that uh, is a bad product in the sense that it's going to cause accidents, or losses, then people are not going to buy the product or they're not going to pay as much for it. So, you know, if I think that at a certain restaurant, my chance of getting food poisoning is high, well, I'm probably not going to go there. And since the restaurant will anticipate that it's going to lose customers if it acquires the reputation of giving its customers food poisoning, the restaurant has a very strong incentive to. Uh, make sure its kitchen is clean. So to the degree that people get information about risk or that the firm would be tarred by having marketed a product that caused a lot of harm, we would expect the firms to be taking a lot of care whether or not liability is present in the background. And there are lots of examples of firms that do all kinds of things uh, to avoid uh, having their reputation harmed. And you know, I mentioned Audi, for example. Audi's sales plummeted. And they almost pulled out of the United States after this problem of sudden acceleration. Uh, Perrier had a problem with some traces of benzene in their water. And Perrier's never really recovered from that. Uh, so, you know, other, other bottled waters have, have stolen a lot of Perrier's market. Um, there's just, there are manifold examples of this. Gerber baby food had a problem with glass uh, in the baby food. The Rely tampon, I don't know if you remember that, Tylenol, you know, millions of examples. So, um, 
Okay, so one's instinct is to say that maybe product liability, liability imposed on manufacturers for harms caused by their products, doesn't do all that much to improve product safety. As I said, it really isn't evidence, at least evidence of which I'm aware, in favor of the proposition that it does much to improve product safety. But what we, what we do know is it increases product prices because of the administrative costs of the liability system, defending and suits and so forth. Now, if we're talking about the other category of accidents where the victims are not customers, um, that's where it would seem that liability is very important. Because if a firm causes harm to people, but it's not as a consequence of, of your having purchased the product of the firm, then the firm really doesn't have any strong incentive to try to cure the problem. And that's where I think it's extremely important that liability be imposed on firms. So if we're talking about the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and I'll be referring to that later, um, you, the, the harm caused by that oil spill was, was not done to customers of, of Exxon. And if we want companies that transport oil over the oceans to take precautions, I think they have to be threatened with very large liability to induce them to make the large expenditures on super tankers that are really safe and on personnel that is you know, up to the task. So this distinction between the two types of accents is from an economic perspective, really important. Um, and, and, and also it raises questions whether we should even have product liability where the products, where the, where the, where the harms are to customers. Now, the traditional uh, legal, analyst, legal analyst, uh, well, generally has the view that not only, well, not only the usual view that I mentioned in regard to automobile accidents, if you, if you acted irresponsibly, you should have to pay. But th there's a superimposed on that idea is that firms are just basically evil. You know, that big corporations are evil. And this is really, I mean, I see this every day at Harvard Law School because it's kind of the norm in the classroom of students and of professors to sort of dump on large corporations. You know, it's as if all the products that they use, the television sets, the cars, and everything like that, are produced by evil entities. Um, it's, it's very strange. And of course, most of the students who graduate from Harvard Law School go to work for corporate America, which, which makes it even stranger. But I do think that um, the sort of gut level reaction of most people uh, to, to, to the question, should there be liability imposed on firms that cause harm, is yes indeed, uh, even more than they th would think that of, of a driver that's negligent. Um, second, again, there's almost no attention paid by, by these people to the effects of product liability on product safety. And I have almost never seen attention paid to the distinction, even though I think it's all important, between whether the victim uh, in a product accident is the customer or not a customer. This is just not a distinction anybody's used to making. Uh, so again, what we see is a completely different orientation. Uh, let me just mention one thing about vaccines since it's in, in my example. I was reading uh, not too long ago an article investigating the um, vaccine DPT uh, that, that is, is given to babies uh, because of the problems of diphtheria, pertussis, and, and tetanus. Uh, that's what DPT stands for, obviously. And um, one of the components of that vaccine, I think it's the pertussis component, can cause adverse side effects. It's pretty unusual, but, but it can happen. I think there could be deafness could be, I think it's even possible to die. Pretty unusual, but it can happen. And as the American liability system became crazier, uh, 
or more enthusiastic about awarding damages, however you want to describe it, um, the price of this vaccine rose. In fact, I think it's now 40, 40 times higher than it used to be, all because of the liability component uh, built into it. The safety, you know, the, the, the frequency of side effects uh, from this vaccine is the same as it was in 1946, basically. Uh, so what you have is a whopping price increase because of the liability system, no change in product safety, and by the way, the price increase has caused many people not to have their babies uh, inoculated, even though you're supposed to. All babies are supposed to have the DPT shots. But um, th something like 10% of babies, maybe it's 9%, something in that uh, region, um, don't get vaccinated because, according to this study, because of um, the increase in the price. Okay, let me move on to my next example. Uh, another, uh, well, okay, the, 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 another example which makes you think of, of, of firms. Um, this example concerns punitive damages. You've probably all read about them. Um, Punitive damages are uh, damages uh, that a liable party, often a firm, has to pay on top of the damages uh, that um, are supposed to compensate for the, for the harm done. So one example would be Exxon. Um, uh, and, and by the way, I should say, uh, just so you, you know what my hidden interest might be, that I, I was a uh, consultant to the Exxon Corporation, hired to help them in their litigation after the oil spill. I'm no longer uh, employed by them. Um, okay, in, in the Exxon Valdez oil spill, uh, the company paid, I think, around $2 billion uh, to compensate for the harm they did. And then on top of that, they were asked to pay another $5 billion in punitive damages. Now, subsequently, that amount was, was knocked down to a much lower amount, but still illustrates that punitive damages can be quite high. And actually, I think I read in the newspaper last week that in another case uh, in Alabama, Exxon did harm, uh, assertedly did harm of I don't know, like 500 million or something like that, less than a billion. And punitive damages of around 12 billion were imposed on them. So punitive damages can be real big. Um, uh, okay, uh, Carnival Cruise Lines. Let me just mention this case because I want to refer to it a little bit later in my discussion of punitive damages. Carnival Cruise Lines runs, you know, love boats, th those kinds of things. Uh, in, in the Caribbean and elsewhere, a very large company. And Carnival um, was found to have dumped wastes on the high seas, not once, but repeatedly. And they're very sneaky about it. You know, doing it, you know, like when, when there's no other vessel around that could spot it, um, doctoring the ship's logs so that if you looked at their logs, you couldn't really tell, uh, you know, what they did. Uh, it's just completely sneaky about their behavior. Uh, and, but they were discovered, and they had to pay punitive damages. You probably heard about the McDonald's hot coffee case where McDonald's was sued because this lady spilled hot coffee on her lap. And then there's a lot of big imposition of, of punitive damages in, in, many, in, in, in tobacco litigation. Okay, so punitive damages are, are out there, pretty important, and companies worry about them. So what's the view of, of economists? I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but uh, sort of a quick sketch of uh, our take on, on punitive damages is, is this, that normally if a company has to pay or a person has to pay an amount equal to the harm that the company or the person did, then this will generate um, a, a, a a proper and appropriate reason to take precautions to prevent harm. 
And so the, the obvious reason is, well, if, for example, you could prevent a certain harm of, of, of $100,000 by spending $50,000, that would be a good thing to do, because it's better for society to spend $50,000 than to lose 100000 And if you would be liable for 100000 if you caused the harm of 100000 then you would find it in your interest to spend the 50000 At the same time, if you would have to spend $200,000 to prevent a $100,000 harm, we wouldn't want you to do that. And if what you would have to pay if you caused 100000 of harm is 100000 you wouldn't spend 200000 to prevent the 100000 of harm. You would just bear the 100000 loss. Now you would pay uh, damages of 100000 So this is a simple and, I think, pretty familiar logic for why we think, we economists, that usually when, when you cause a harm and you're found liable, the amount you should pay is equal to the harm. Um, and, and therefore, uh, if, you, if you have to pay more than the harm you do, uh, this wouldn't be good. And, and why wouldn't this be good usually? Well, it's because you might be induced to take excessive precautions. Like if you had to, if the consequence of, of causing a $100,000 harm is that you will be sued and have to pay a million dollars, then you would find it in your interest, in order to avoid having to pay a million dollars, to spend 200000 or 500000 to prevent the $100,000 harm, because you would be paying, by assumption, not the 100000 but the much larger number, in, in this example, of a million. So the problem with imposing damages larger than the harm that is done is that it can lead to uh, this perverse outcome of people spending too much to avoid harm and also to product prices that are really high that make products either unavailable or just reduce by a lot the sales of those products, like in the vaccine. Uh, example. Uh, I think, by the way, that most of, the, most of the, the companies in the United States that produce vaccines do it only because they are insulated by special legislation against liability. Uh, I don't know if you remember President Ford, but there was some, I think he had to do something to protect the drug industry to get them to produce swine flu influenza. And if you're talking about anthrax and you know, development of anthrax vaccines, again, the, the, the drug companies needed protection. So there's no way, I think, that most, most drug companies would produce vaccines if they really faced the threat of liability, including punitive damages, that we have in the United States. So you know, th th that illustrates how the availability of products can also be affected by punitive damages. OK. but. There is an argument, an economic argument, for punitive damages. And the, and the main argument concerns um, the possibility that a firm that causes harm would not be sued uh, uh, with probability one for causing harm. And if the firm is going to escape liability with some frequency, then if you only impose liability equal to the harm, you'd be giving the firm a free ride in, in those situations where it escaped liability, and therefore you would not be creating a proper deterrent. So what, what does that say? Well, it says in the, in the case of Carnival Cruise Lines that was dumping wastes on the high seas, that it should be hit with punitive damages. Uh, it was really only luck that I think Carnival was discovered. Um, also suggests that um, in the case of the Exxon Valdez, that since there was no way that that company could escape liability for what it did because it was so obvious, you know, polluting all, all of Prince William Sound, uh, that according to this view, they should not have to pay punitive damages. I, just as a footnote, when I said this to my parents at the time when I was working for Exxon, they really wondered what happened to me. You know, did I stray 
uh, because my parents uh, thought you know Exxon is like the personification of evil. My my mother stopped buying their gasoline, although after about a month she she went back to her favorite station, which I think most people did. But um, the you know, the, 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 this is only to point out that the um, sort of the gut level reaction to whether punitive damages should be imposed is very, very different from um, the approach that is suggested by economic analysis. And uh, as I say on this slide, uh, there's this, this focus on whether the behavior is really bad that's in, in deciding whether to impose punitive damages. And there's not very much attention to the effects of punitive damages, which, as I say, can be perverse, I mean, depending on the circumstances. There's almost no attention paid by the courts to the likelihood of being caught, although that's changing somewhat. And there's a focus on the wealth of the firm, something I didn't mention, but one thing that seems to be of great importance in determining how large the liability bill is of the corporation is how rich the corporation is. Like juries will often be told by, uh, by, the, by the plaintiff's lawyer to take like 1% of the, of the corporation's profits or, 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 or value. Um, but this isn't, as I say, it's not always true. And actually, I was reading on the plane uh, here a, an opinion of Richard Posner, who's you know, one of the fathers of, of law and economics, uh, who's a, a judge you may know in, in Chicago, an appeals court judge. This was a decision on a, a case involving people who were bitten by bed bugs in a Red Roof Inn in Chicago. I actually almost stayed at that Red Roof Inn a month ago. Uh, and um, so uh, the, he, he, he awarded, and he, he's, he's Mr. Law and Economics, he awarded something like $5,000 in compensation to this brother and sister who were bitten by bed bugs, and about $185,000 in punitive damages. And, and the reason he gave is that he said the Red Roof Inn was trying to conceal uh, the presence of bed bugs, and he offered the comment that the way they were trying to conceal the presence of bed bugs was unbelievably stupid, because what they were telling their customers is that they were bitten by ticks, a a as if, you know, as, as if this would, you know, you know, make them uh, okay uh, with, with the experience. Um, and, and he said they, they were also, uh, Apparently, this Red Roof Inn, I, mean, I, I can believe it because I know where it's located, it's, had, it's a very good location, so they had a lot of business. And I don't think they were acquiring a bad reputation because most of their clientele were people from out of town. This was adverted to in his opinion. So basically, what, what he was saying is that the Red Roof Inn was relying on, uh, among other things, the idea that it probably wouldn't be sued. If it were sued, it would only be for a small amount. But you know, who, who's going to take the trouble to sue them for getting bitten by bed bugs? So he says to give them a proper incentive to fumigate their hotel and to give other hotels the right signal, they need to face punitives. So this is an example both of uh, where punitives would be called for by the economic way of thinking, and of course, where a judge, uh, no coincidence that was Posner, um, actually applied that kind of thinking and, and awarded uh, punitives. Um, okay, where am I? Okay. This is slide number 10. Um, Okay, as you can see from this, uh, from the title here, the question that I want to address is, is there too much litigation? I think many people think that there are too many lawyers. Um, when I sometimes meet law students, I say, you know, half facetiously, a, a good mind is a terrible thing to waste. You know, like, why didn't you go into engineering or medical school or something like that? Um, I do have a very strong 
gut level feeling that there are too many lawyers in the United States, far too much litigation, um, far too much money uh, is given to lawyers. Uh, just one example of that is Dickie Scruggs, who's Trent Lott's brother-in-law, who's one of the lawyers who uh, sued the tobacco industry, I read, bought a yacht that cost a hundred million dollars. Um, so, you know, if lawyers can buy uh, pleasure craft that cost a hundred million dollars, sort of makes you think. Um, okay, so from the economic point of view, how, how can we analyze the question, is there too much legal activity? Well, uh, I want to abstract from, from one possible cause of uh, too much legal activity, and that is that the content of laws might be off. In other words, if the amount of money that you could win if you went to court was, was, was too high, well, that could cause too much litigation. Um, but I want to put that possible explanation, which I think has some validity, to the feeling that there's too much litigation to the side and ask whether there's something else that might produce this result. And, and I think there is. And so I'm going to illustrate it with two numerical examples. Okay, so the first example is one in which uh, I want to suggest to you that, it's, that, that in this example, people will sue even though it would be best from a social perspective that they didn't sue. The example is extremely simple. Suppose that there's some category of accident in which the harm is $10,000. And it would cost $1,000 to sue, and let's say also $1,000 to defend. Um, now, also assume that the, th there will be no deterrent effect, no, no effect on the frequency of these accidents of suit. That might be because it's really expensive to reduce the likelihood of accidents. You know, some, some things you just can't stop from happening. It's just it's too hard to do it. Or, you, you know, you can think of this as, uh, uh, you, you can think about automobile accidents if, if you believe that they can't easily be prevented. Uh, you can tell yourself some story. So if it's true that suit is not reducing the uh, the accident frequency because, uh, well, if, if that's the case, then um, we don't really want people suing because it's not buying us anything. Yet the incentive of a victim is obviously to bring suit because if a, a victim can spend $1,000 and get 10000 why the heck not do it? And by the way, when the victim spends 1000 to get 10000 the victim is also forcing the defendant to spend 1000 So that's another uh, thing that's going on here. So what, what this example, very simple, is supposed to illustrate to you is that the financial incentives to sue have very little to do with the social value of suit. Uh, and in this example, the social value of suit uh, could be said to be zero because it's not creating beneficial behavior. Obviously, it could, the, the example would still be uh, one that had force if there were benefits in terms of behavior created by suit but outweighed by the litigation costs. And if you ask me, you know, why do I think in America uh, you know, there, there's, there's so much litigation but it's not producing, perhaps, uh, as much as we would like? I think part of the answer would be that there are a lot of times when you can, where it's profitable to sue, but suit is really doing very little. I think almost all of automobile accident litigation exemplifies that. Okay, the second example is one in which, um, it's, it's an opposite kind of example in which people don't bring suit, but we would like it if they did. So here's the example. 
uh, continue to assume that $1,000 is the cost of bringing suit, uh, but that if suit is brought, the harm, uh, which I'm going to suppose is now $500 uh, rather than $10,000, uh, if suit were brought, then the prospect of being sued would make people take a very inexpensive precaution. And that inexpensive precaution would lower the harm from a certainty of $500 to um, a harm that only comes about 1% of the time. And the cost of that precaution would be a dollar. So really I'm saying, hey, people can spend just a dollar and reduce from 100% down to 1% the likelihood of a $500 harm. So that's the scenario. Now, in this situation, people would not bring suit. The reason they wouldn't bring suit is it, the assumption is it costs $1,000 to sue, but the harm is $500. You'd only get $500 if you brought suit, so you're not going to sue. You're not going to spend $1,000 to get $500. So in this situation, injuring people would know they're not going to be sued because it's too expensive to sue. So therefore, they would not take a precaution that's cheap. And therefore, $500 would be the harm that would be caused for sure in society. OK. Now let's imagine there's government subsidy of suit. You can think of it as legal aid. If that's the case, anybody who causes harm of $500 will know that, that he'll be sued and have, and have to pay $500. So people will take the $1 precaution. And society will be better off. And in, in fact, the cost in expected terms will be $26 rather than $500. I'll just rapidly go through the calculation. The, re the reason is that because the injurer will be induced to spend $1 on the precaution, we have $1 of costs. And then 1% of the time, there will be harm. In that 1% of occasions when there's harm, the total social costs will be the $500 of harm plus $2,000 of legal costs. $1,000 to bring the suit, even though subsidized by the government is, is the cost, and 1000 of defense. So you have $2,500 worth of costs occurring with a 1% probability that's $25 in expected terms, plus the $1 of precaution cost, so it's $26. So in this example, social costs fall, fall from $500 down to $26 if the government subsidizes suit. And what's going on here is sort of an, it's, it's, it's analogous to what went on in the first example in the sense that the people who consider suit are looking really only at the cost to them of suit and the benefit to them of suit. And that's very, very different from what suit actually does for society. It has no relationship whatever, the calculus of the individual, whether to sue, has no relationship to whether suit will produce a deterrent effect, for example. That's based on very different factors. So the economic view then of the volume of litigation is that we can have absolutely no confidence that the amount of litigation that we observe squares with what's socially desirable and really invites uh, policy types to think about whether this or that area of litigation is uh, worthwhile. Uh, be because we don't have, you know, like, the amount of pizza sold in the United States, I believe, uh, is probably about right. Because you know, you go, you decide, do I want to spend two dollars for a slice of pizza or not? Okay, you're comparing your the value you would get from eating the pizza to the price of the pizza, which is reflecting the cost of the tomatoes and everything else that's in it. And you know, standard economics says, okay, uh, these decisions are basically going to produce a good result. Pizza is eaten and consumed when the value to the person exceeds the social cost of production reflected by the price. Well, this is not true in the market for a litigation. That the, 
that the, the decision that a person makes whether or not to sue is really infected with latent externalities. And so there's, there's just no reason to have faith in the social desirability of that. And so, as I say, it really makes you want to analyze whether litigation is worthwhile. Uh, contrast with the uh, traditional take on this, well, basically uh, the legal community says people have a fundamental right to sue. They should have access to the courts. And uh, yes, they, they say, well, yeah, it's true, it's expensive to sue, that's unfortunate. Maybe an answer to it is to subsidize suit. Uh, yeah, it's true that we can't subsidize everybody. We don't, we don't want an un unending amount of litigation. But uh, the, 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 the focus, the, the orientation of the people is that if there's a law, you should really have the right, uh, and, and the law would um, award you money, then you should really be able to collect that money. Uh, and of course, that point of view not only ignores the question, what is the law doing for us, and how, how is our incentive to use the legal system related to what the law is doing for us, but it also presupposes that there's something right about the actual laws um, on the books. I mean, they're not saying that you should have a right to go to court in order to collect damages if there's no legal right to collect damages. For example, they're not saying that if I promise to go to lunch with you and then I break my engagement, that I should be able to go to court and sue you. And the reason they're not saying that is there's no law that says I have a right to collect money for breaking my lunch date with you. But um, in some sense, uh, th they should have on the table the question, well, does it, they, they can't just say any law that's on the books should result in uh, your having a right to um, collect because why aren't they considering whether the law itself uh, makes sense? Okay, um, I think this is almost my last example. Um, okay, this one, Obviously, what should be the magnitude of sanctions uh, for infractions where, where the public is enforcing the law? So as I say, thinking about traffic violations, cheating on your taxes, uh, robbing uh, the 7-Eleven, um, whatever. Uh, the economic view, again simplified, is that uh, sanctions should bear a relationship to the harm that's done and also should be raised if it's unlikely to be caught. And we see this, uh, some evidence of this view all over the map. In fact, in, in the Bible, I think it says someplace um, that if you, if you stole uh, at night, the punishment should be greater than if you stole during the day. Uh, if you uh, steal uh, um, this is another example from the ancient code but it's not from the Bible. If you steal somebody's uh, animal and you're caught, well there's a penalty but if you if you were caught and you would cut the animal up you know, into pieces like to eat or something then the punishment was higher. And the explanation given is that, well, it's harder to catch a person who cuts up an animal they stole because you can't recognize it usually. You know, like how do you catch somebody who managed to steal it and cut it up? And that's why um, the punishment is higher. So um, see lots of evidence of this um, proposition that you would like the punishment, at least from an economics pr perspective, to be higher if the chance of catching people is low because otherwise how do you adequately deter? Okay, so that's one central point uh, about the economic view. And a, and a second one is, is a more subtle uh, point 
uh, and, and this was actually um, uh, first uh, put forward by Gary Becker. And, and that is that uh, because enforcement, law enforcement, is expensive, uh, it, 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 it's attractive to save on enforcement resources by using fewer enforcement agents, you know, fewer police. And to make up for that, by raising sanctions. So an example would be um, what, what I have at the end. If you have a certain number of uh, people who go out and check parking meters to see whether you, you park too long, um, these people are, you know, they're making salaries. They're, they're expensive. And so Becker would say, well, if right now in a certain city there are 20 people who have this job and they're each paid Forty thousand a year. That's eight hundred thousand dollars in ex public expense per year. He would say, "Okay, let's knock down the number of inspectors from twenty to ten. We'll knock off four hundred thousand dollars of expense. And if the ticket pr ticket is now say twenty dollars for having parked too long at a meter or next to a fire hydrant, whatever it might be, let's raise the uh, ticket from $20 to $40. And, and, and the argument is that, well, whatever the probability of being caught used to be, it's now halved, but the ticket price is doubled. So in, in some rough sense, the deterrent that used to exist is the same as that we, the one that we have now. The one that we have now is, you know, ha half the probability and double the fine. So we presumably that the behavior of people is going to be roughly the same, but we've saved four hundred thousand dollars in our city's budget, which is a good thing. And of course, the argument can be extended, and actually it leads to a conclusion that really I think affronts most of us in some sense, which is that okay, you want to enforce any kind of regulation like littering. Uh, what we should really do is catch one out of every, you know, 10 million people who litters and then electrocute them. Uh, uh, because that would be really, it would really save enforcement resources. You know, we could have one person, not even one full-time police officer, just say, you know, every once in a while, for like 10 seconds, say, you're a police officer, see if you can spot anybody who has violated anything, and then just really, you know, give the maximum penalty to whoever you, you catch. Okay, well, there are some answers to why within economics to why the argument doesn't really extend that far. But, but I pointed out to, to you know, show you that the view of economics with regard to the size of sanctions is, is not only that they should reflect the probability of escaping liability, but also that it's, it's good for the probability of catching people to be low because that, that way we save enforcement resources, which makes the optimal penalty high. Okay, well, all of this is really out of sync with what most people think. Because most people believe that punishment should be in proportion to the gravity of the act. Like, nobody would say uh, that if you let your juicy fruit wrapper fall, out to, fall out to the ground, that you should be electrocuted, much less pay a fine of $150. They just think it's just, it's crazy to have a punishment that's so out of proportion to the, uh, the bad thing that you did. So there's a tremendous, I think, disconnect between what sort of stylized economic thinking says about uh, punishment magnitude and what most people think, whether they are you know, legal academics, judges, or just uh, people um, on the street. And this view about you know, what's fair punishment does not seem to be very sensitive to the probability of being caught either. Um, so we have a big difference here. Okay, let me uh, close with, with two quick examples which are less general than the ones I've been given to sort of illustrate how you can actually use some of this stuff either in litigation or in sort of interpreting sort of fairly detailed uh, doctrines of the law. Because most of these examples so far have been fairly general, sort of 
general policy uh, issues. Uh, okay, so let me uh, put this overhead up. And th this concerns a case in which I was an expert. Um, and I was hired by uh, an individual who was blowing the whistle on this company called Coke Oil, a company I'd never heard of, even though I think it's either the largest or the second largest privately owned corporation in the United States. And it's in the business of um, trans buying oil from producers of oil and transporting it, a natural gas um, uh, transport through pipelines and so forth. It, it's, uh, it's a very big corporation. And um, this company, Coke, was discovered to have cheated uh, systematically over years uh, many of its customers, including uh, American Indians. Um, and the way they cheated was, uh, in some sense, simple, which is that uh, if they went up to your, say you have a producing oil well in Oklahoma, the truck would pull up like every month and drain your, your uh, holding tanks of oil and you know, give you a receipt for the oil that they took. And what they did was they, they, they didn't measure the amount of oil properly. Um, they, if they took 1,000 gallons, they would give you a receipt for like 995. So, so in some sense, it's a very simple scheme. They're just stealing oil. Uh, and they also stole natural gas. Uh, and, um, okay, so uh, it turns out for legal reasons that you don't need to be concerned with that because the United States government is trustee for um, uh, Indian lands on which a lot of these wells were, that a, uh, something called the False Claims Act applies. Uh, to Coke oil, and, and what the False Claims Act says is that for every false statement that the company made, they have to pay between five and ten thousand dollars. Let's just call it five thousand for simplicity. Okay, and so th this was not in dispute. Coke was found, you know, liable for having done this kind of cheating. I'm sure if a Coke representative were here, he would say, "Well, you know." We didn't do it. We, yeah, we were found liable. We didn't do it. So I'm, I'm standing here not saying they actually did it. I'm saying they were found liable for it. Okay. Now, um, the whistleblower for whom I was working, this is as, as, a, as a, another footnote, really wanted Coke Oil to pay a large amount because he was going to get 30% of any penalty they had to pay to the government. Okay. Um, the issue in the case was this. What is the meaning of the two words, false report? Because Coke Oil claimed the following, that its monthly uh, documents that it sent summarizing its purchases of oil uh, to the Department of Interior uh, were the false reports for which it should have to pay 5000 a crack. So it should have to pay roughly like $60,000 a year for all the years that it was cheating because it only filed a false report once every month. The plaintiff, you know, the, my, my whistleblower friend, who happens to be a billionaire, by the way, he's not hurting for money. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a, I, I can t afterwards, if somebody's interested, I can tell you some background to who, who the individual is. But, um, he claimed that every single time a Coke oil employee went to a, a somebody's place and he gave the person a receipt for the oil uh, and wrote down the wrong number for the number of gallons, that, 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 that each of those was a false statement. And there turned out to be tens of thousands of those statements. So the potential liability was way up in the billions. So you can imagine that when the liability could either be, you know, like 100,000, 200,000, or like 4 billion, 6 billion, something like that. Maybe there would be a legal dispute, okay? So, the, so let, let me just quickly explain what the nature of my uh, testimony uh, was, because it relates to this idea of, uh, of, of penalties. It was very simple. It's that let's look at the amount of money that Coke stole, which we could compute, and 
let's try and get some idea of the likelihood that Coke would have been found out for its scheme. And it was extremely clever in how it perpetrated uh, this scheme. Uh, because it didn't always steal, only stole small amounts. Occasionally, it actually mismeasured in favor of the person from whom it was taking oil. So you really would need a statistician to sort of prove what they were doing. But, but, a stati but, but if you did have a statistician, which was, and, and there was one in the case, it's incontrovertible, really, in a statistical sense, what they were up to. Okay, so what I did was basically say, look at the amount they stole. Here's a reasonable assessment of the likelihood that they, they would have escaped notice. They didn't, but there was a likelihood they wouldn't have. And make sure that the sanction is large enough to deter a company like that from stealing. So for example, if they, I don't remember the exact numbers, but if you assume that they, if they stole 500 million and the odds of being caught were one half, you would want them to pay a billion dollars so that on average, their expected penalty would be a half of a billion or 500 million canceling out what they stole. So the point is that you can work backwards from using the simple economic idea, what, what it takes to create deterrence, to figure out how much money they should pay. And then I said, look, we don't know what the word false reports mean. There's no way to go to the dictionary and figure it out. But we know the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to deter companies from making false claims. And in order to deter, we must interpret the words false report so that it will yield a uh, penalty big enough uh, to do what the law is intended to do. So this is a, a fairly simple example of how you can use uh, the law and economics approach in practice. Um, okay, last example uh, concerning a fairly particular doctrine of, um, uh, in this case, contract law. Uh, it concerns the duty to disclose information when you're making a contract. Uh, so one example would be you're selling a house. You, you happen to know that in rainstorms, uh, the basement uh, will flood. Uh, should you have a duty to tell this to uh, somebody who's looking at your home about and thinking about buying it? That, that would be an example. Another example. Um, and this, this example actually uh, is taken from a, from a famous case in which um, an oil company, uh, well, the company that did more than uh, extract oil was also uh, in, in, uh, a developer of minerals, mineral deposits, a uh, company called Texas Gulf Sulphur actually. Uh, thought there were some valuable mineral deposits uh, in an area. And so they had their crack geologists sort of study the terrain, everything. They, 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 they flew airplanes around to sort of map the area, check it out. And they decided that um, <coughs> probably there were some very valuable deposits of, of bauxite um, in a particular area. So they approached the landowner, who was a farmer, and they bought the right to um, extract minerals from that land. But they did not tell the farmer that they thought there were really valuable deposits under his land. They, they failed to disclose uh, this to the farmer when they made that contract. Um, okay, so these, these are two examples of uh, cases <coughs> or situations in which the issue of disclosure of information and your duty to disclose it arise. Now from the economic perspective, the, the, the important question to ask is, what would be the effect, you know, what would be the effect and is it good or bad of a duty to disclose? Let's take the second case, the Texas Gulf Sulphur case first. Um, in that case, in, in a very interesting um, article, uh, a, uh, a law professor, actually uh, uh, dean of the Yale Law School, uh, Tony Croman, uh, he suggested that 
it might not be a good idea to force a company like Texas Gulf Sulphur to tell the farmer what they found. And, and the reason, he said, is that if, if you think about what this would do to the incentives of a company like Texas Gulf Sulphur, it would possibly cause them not to investigate whether there are mineral deposits. Because that's a fairly expensive enterprise. They have to hire PhD geologists. They have to fly airplanes around and all of that. And then if they are forced to tell the farmer uh, what, that, they, that they found a really great uh, uh, indication of deposits, what's the farmer going to do? He's going to charge them an arm and a leg. And you know, there are other people who can extract deposits and probably uh, take away the profits that would be the only thing that would induce the company to have investigated in the first place. So he suggested uh, that, therefore, the courts should be uh, cherry of imposing a, a duty to disclose in that kind of situation. But in the leaky basement situation, the arguments go in a different direction because you don't need to allow somebody to sell their house without disclosing uh, the presence of a leaky basement to induce them to find out about the leaky basement. They're going to find out because they're living in the house, you know, unless they never go down to the basement. Um, so th 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 there's no reason to do that. Moreover, if you don't tell a buyer that the basement is leaky, maybe the buyer buys the house, stores valuable stuff in the basement, thinking that it's dry, and then there's a rainstorm and you know it's ruined. So obviously, there are things bad about uh, the effects of failing to impose a duty to disclose in the case of the leaky basement, you know, unlike uh, the Texas Gulf Sulphur case. So this, this is an example which illustrates, I think, that when you look at the sort of the nooks and crannies of the law, you look at specific doctrines, that, that if you think about the effects of the particular doctrine, you can often discover uh, some interesting and helpful um, things which would not be apparent if you weren't in that habit. And of course, the, the usual view of lawyers about duties to, to disclose is that everybody should disclose because not disclosing is like lying. You know, it's fibbing, and that's, that's a bad thing. So they don't tend to even think in these terms. Okay, that's the end of my examples, and now I'm on to my last two uh, slides, and then uh, we can have a, a discussion about this. Um, some general observations, very briefly. Uh, one is that the, the, the approach that I, I've been talking about applies very broadly, and in some sense, uh, why am I even saying that? Because if the approach is one which is defined by looking at the effects of legal rules, how could it not apply broadly? But I still think it's worth, worth saying that. So it's not an approach, you, know, you could tell this, I think, from most of the discussion, uh, today, it's not an approach that applies mainly to business uh, business law. Uh, and so, in some sense, the word economics is is misleading, because it's really a consequentialist in character, not really economic. Um, okay, there, there there are two sort of major criticisms that I think most law and economics people encounter that I want to to mention. Uh, one is, uh, other than they don't like us, they, they often say that, um, uh, half in jest, uh, um, you, you can't always tell. Um, okay, w one beef is that we don't pay attention to the effects of legal rules on the well-being of rich versus poor. So if a legal rule will reduced accident frequency, but it winds, but, but it turns out that uh, poor people are going to be made worse off and people who buy, drive BMWs better off for some reason, then we're not paying attention to that in our, in our usual analysis and therefore we're leaving out something that's very important. This is a, this is a um, criticism that's often heard 
or at least, at least in law schools. And my reaction to it, I think, is pretty predictable, which is that uh, if we want to redistribute money in the United States and sort of make the distribution of wealth or income more equal, well, that's fine, and different people can have different opinions about how much uh, redistribution there should be. But the way to do it is not by um, monkeying around with tort law or contract law, uh, because th th that uh, if we deviate from the kinds of laws that produce so-called efficient results, this is going to cost society something. It's much better to use the income tax and transfer system to accomplish distributional objectives. Now, there are lots of uh, counters to that response of mine, and I have lots of counters to those counters, but we don't, we don't have time to talk about it right now. Okay, second major criticism is, in a sense, what I've uh, been talking about uh, already, which is that when we analyze things, we don't really pay attention to these ideas of fairness, like uh, that a wrongdoer should have to pay, that the punishment should be in proportion to the gravity of the act, you know, that uh, you should have your day in court. I mean, they're just, there are millions of these. And my reaction to that is, you're right that we usually don't pay official attention to them, uh, that we should, you know, if, if we did a more complete analysis, we should pay uh, attention to uh, these uh, conceptions of what's right and wrong, but only to the extent that uh, people really want them to be satisfied, to the extent that people have a, a taste for them in the economic meaning of uh, a taste for something. We should not give them any kind of independent importance. We should not, you know, just because Kant said the proper punishment is really an eye for an eye, that doesn't mean we should do what Kant says. We should only, uh, we, we, we should only keep the punishment in proportion to the gravity of the act to the extent that people are bothered uh, as citizens when they read about somebody who's punished uh, either too little or too much. That should weigh only to the extent that people care about it not because some law professor or a philosopher said it's a, it's a right that cannot be abridged. Um, so that's sort of a quick response to that complaint. This, this book that Barack referred to, Fairness Versus Welfare, is a much longer, probably too longer response to um, uh, that argument. Okay, uh, to conclude, you know, what, what, what is the importance and, and the future of uh, this? subject, well, <coughs> I think uh, if you ask what about academic writing, uh, that the, the view is having in some areas a kind of revolutionary impact, which is not surprising because uh, it is, you know, again, it's the view that is concerned with discussing in a serious way how law affects behavior. So if, if your view is that which is examining how law affects behavior, it really has to be kind of important and uh, it shouldn't be surprising that it's changing uh, the discourse in certain, about certain areas of law. And one example, probably the best example, would be tort law concerning accidents. But in many areas, I would say it's having, even though it should, the situation should be different, it's having almost no influence. So it's a very uneven uh, influence in academic uh, writing. Uh, now, what about influence on legal practice and um, judicial decisions? Uh, there's a very slow, but I think steady, uh, increase in influence in the United States in part because people graduating from law schools are going into practice and becoming judges. So you have uh, Posner and Easterbrook in, uh, the, on the appeals court in Chicago. You have 
uh, Doug Ginsburg in Washington, uh, Stephen Williams in Washington, the appeals court. There, there, there are lots of judges uh, at the appeals court level who are to one degree or another familiar with or adherents of this. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer uh, is, is very aware of this and cites this and uses it in some of his opinions. Um, so there, you know, there, there is uh, increase in influence, but, but it's slow and it's mainly a generational thing. It's, it's not so much that people are changing their minds as it is that younger people are sort of replacing older people. Um, that's how it's happening. Within the economics profession, I would say that uh, the degree to which law and economics is sort of influencing things measured by, say, courses, uh, articles published in journals, and so forth, is pretty small. Um, for example, there are, to my knowledge, no courses at the graduate level in law and economics in the United States in economics departments. There are a fair number of undergraduate courses, but not graduate ones. It's rare to see a graduate student who's doing a thesis in this area. Uh, but I think like 10 years from now, you'll, 10 years from now or maybe 15 years from now, I would predict that law and economics will become a real subfield of economics. And there'll be courses taught in it. There'll be It'll be a field within economics like labor economics or international trade or something like it. I think it's natural, really inevitable that that will happen. I wish it were true now, uh, but it isn't. So that's a, uh, th those are some comments about the uh, importance of it. And I'm now ready, happy to entertain uh, questions. Yes? Boy, one uh, relatively minor but not insignificant uh, that I'm sure is being raised, and the other is uh, more major. The first is with regard to the deterrent effect in a world in which people are insured, particularly in automobile accidents. I think anyone who's had teenage children and seen his insurance rates go up uh, with accidents knows that there is some deterrent effect there, and that should not be ignored. And certainly in works in compensation, uh, that's also an issue. The more substantive point, though, uh, relates to your uh, vision of the New Zealand uh, model as uh, the way to go. I have some experience with that because I taught in New Zealand in University of Otago in uh, 1985, and I knew Jeff Palmer, who was there. Mm -hmm. When they put that program into effect in around 1980, early 1980, the amount of compensation you got for loss of earning, you know, earning capacity, the maximum at least was roughly what 80% of the New Zealand population, or at least 80% of the New Zealand population fell within the parameter of what it is you got. As New Zealand opened up its economy and became more Americanized, you got much greater disparities of income in the country. And they, have, they are having problems of funding the system as it exists, and they still have never confronted the problem of how do you compensate for pain and suffering. If you want to attack the thing, you've got to take a position as to whether pain and suffering is really uh, compensable. And of course, the Australians you know, rejected uh, mm -hmm. the adoption of the New Zealand system in the 1980s. So I just think that should just be added to the, to the discussion on those issues. Well, um, as to your, <coughs> your, your, your first point, uh, I think you're, you're obviously right that um, insurance uh, can influence outcomes and and, and, and you, you're certainly right that one way is that in, in, in where, where especially where insurance rates are not regulated, what you have to pay if you have a teenage male, like a 17-year-old, uh, in insurance rates is very high. So if you say to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, child, I'll call him Junior, if you say to Junior, Junior, you're going to wait one more year before driving, you might well be reducing accidents because people like Junior create havoc on the roads. And in fact, I've heard empiricists say that they believe that some of the effect that they do see of the liability system is possibly due to exactly the effect that, uh, that, that you're pointing out, that young males are driving less because their parents don't want to pay the hike in the insurance premiums for them. So 
um, you know, is, it's an empirical question. And, and of course, when I suggest maybe it, it's good for us to adopt no fault, this is, I'm sort of painting with a broad brush. And also, I, I admit the possibility that maybe it's not a good idea. But my instinct is that probably some kind of no fault idea is good. Maybe it should be limited to people who are over a certain age. Maybe we should allow suit, not only against trucking companies, but against uh, children or their parents, if they're, especially if they're males, and teenagers. That's quite possible. Um, as to your, you know, your second point about New Zealand and compensation and pain and suffering and all, all of that, um, my, my reaction is, uh, just very quickly, that um, first of all, if the level of compensation is lower uh, in New Zealand after they got rid of the tort system, and it would be socially desirable for whatever reason to raise the levels of compensation, uh, then that is not an argument for reinstituting the tort system. What it is an argument for is either providing a higher level of social insurance coverage or you know, subsidizing the purchase of private insurance or something like it. Because if we want to get more compensation to people, we shouldn't do it in the expensive way of channeling it through uh, the tort system. So that, that's sort of a, a quick response. Um, yes? Uh, one, of the one, of the, one of the criticisms uh, that I've been participating in the process of, uh, of economic theft, it's not all that uh, reliable as a forecaster. It's easy to look at history and you know, say this caused this, this caused that. Is there anything to be said? What is hard with predictions? What's the story on improving? Economic ability to the and then how would that apply to the law? Well, I think that um, you know, empirical work is, is always difficult, but, but my, my belief is that um, a lot can be done by spending some money to do empirical work. I mean, it's rather remarkable that you've got the United States, it's a big country, pumps out a lot of lawyers every year, like 40 or 50,000 of them. There are lots of law, law professors. And the number of law professors who do empirical work uh, might be, you know, who, who do serious empirical work, who you know, have like a PhD uh, that would enable them to do empirical work, who are in law faculties. I don't know what the number is. It might be four. You know, it's incredibly low. The percentage of law professors who do empirical work has got to be less than 1%. The percentage of people in economics departments or in medical schools or schools of public health who do empirical work might be 30 or 40%. We're, th there's almost no effort made to gather data to help us predict or explain what's happened. So when Congress wants to adopt a new law and they get you know, the experts to testify, the experts are generally relying on anecdote, feeling, uh, but not the kind of uh, information that they could be in a parallel universe. Uh, so, yeah, it's too bad we can't do better uh, right now than we can, but there's certainly opportunity, which I think law schools really ought to seize, but they're, they're really not interested. You know, facts, no, they're not interested in facts, basically. I mean, we don't even know how many legal cases there are every year. I tried to find out how many cases there are every year. And one, one source I went to said there are 80 million cases a year in the United States. And I thought to myself, well, gee, I think the population is like 280 or something. Does this mean like one out of every four people is suing every year? Like how, how could this be? And one suspicion was every time you get a parking ticket and you pay it, that's a case. You've settled the case by paying the ticket. That didn't seem to be the explanation for the figure. I never found out. So. Look, think about what the state of sophistication, of knowledge of the numbers and the effects must be if I, after hiring research assistants, could not find out you know, how many cases there are and just came up with a, with a number that seems wacky. It's, it's, it's a pathetic situation. Yes? Uh, I was wondering, based on your point that uh, you punish 
for a bad act to be commensurate with the seriousness of that bad act. I don't think what your thoughts are on you know, a place like Singapore where the chewing gum in public is, has a serious type of effect. Do you think they have it backwards, or uh, do you think that it works to have really perhaps ridiculous um, punishments for seemingly trivial uh, misdemeanors? Well, I mean, what I think is that uh, and if I were a social planner, uh, I would try to find out how much crime has been reduced in Singapore by these punishments. I would also try to find out how much people, you know, how, what was the attitude of people? Because if, if people all over Singapore in their living rooms at dinner are sort of saying, oh, it's terrible what's, what's happening, if kids are going to sleep at night saying, Mommy, if I leave, if I leave gum on my school desk, am I really going to be beaten uh, to a pulp and caned in public? If you know, kids are worrying about it, there's a lot of disutility created by the disproportionality that, that would influence me. On the other hand, if people are pretty blasé about it and they really like the fact that there's very little litter and that they say you know, caning is not that bad, you know, it hurts, but then, then it's over with, sort of quick, and, and then it's done, uh, my attitude would be different. You know, in Saudi Arabia, take Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. They have very similar, I think, profiles of um, uh, uh, the, the religion, the religious uh, profile of those two countries, I think, is pretty similar. Yet in Saudi Arabia, I think if you steal, or do, uh, if you steal, they, they, they um, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but they cut off limbs in a hospital. You know, the arms, legs, it's, it's, it's rotating. There's, there's an order, okay? We think that's terrible, okay? That's us. Uh, in Kuwait, it's a more Western system, and I think that there's a dramatic difference in, in, in the crime in the two countries. Now, you know, if we were raised in Saudi Arabia and we thought it was quite natural and we did not consider the punishment disproportionate, so that population, if that population is not upset about it and finds it natural and would be upset if somebody who did something for which they think the proper punishment is amputation of a limb, but in fact that didn't happen, then for that society, I would be saying, well, I think amputation of limbs is a good idea. And actually, for, for a long period of time, I think in Europe, if you did certain bad things, you were branded. Like uh, on your, well, for a while, I think you were branded on your thumb. Uh, now, today, you know, I can just imagine what the New York Times would say about the proposition that we should brand people for stealing. But at that time, it was socially useful because jails were very expensive. If you branded somebody, it's quite obvious that they were a crime, and the whole community, you know, would, would look down at them for having committed a crime. So it was very functional. My suspicion is it was looked upon as fine, you know, not disproportionate, just fine, all things considered. Yes. How did you treat the um, punitive damages in the tobacco company from an economic point of view? Because you know they have these huge punitive damages against them, and they're um, harming their customers, but yet they don't really seem to be concerned with the harm caused to the customers. Well. Um, I mean, one answer you might not like is that, well, the people who smoke seem to be aware of the risk of um, harm. And if they're aware of the risk to harm, you know, why do we think smoking, uh, putting aside the secondhand smoke problem, which I think is actually significant. But putting that aside, you know, the question could be asked, well, if people want to use something that's dangerous, but they're, they're getting utility from it, it's their choice. I mean, you know, America's obese today, and increasingly so. Should the makers of ice cream, uh, fatty foods, uh, be sued? Uh, that, you know, that could be more causing more harm than Cigarettes. Now, I think a big difference, though, with cigarettes is, is uh, the issue of addiction. 
So if it's true that the tobacco companies are not informing people of the risk of becoming addicted and people don't know about that risk when they decide to smoke, which is generally as young teenagers, then that makes the tobacco issue different and, and, and would suggest that you know, maybe liability is a good idea. Now, you, know, you say the tobacco companies aren't concerned with the harm. You know, my, my own experience with, with business people is they're, they're, they're basically just concerned with money, really. You know, I mean, okay, they're somewhat concerned with other things, but they're all concerned with money, whether it's people who work for Ben and Jerry's, a good, comp a good company, or people who work for Philip Morris, a so-called bad company. Um, they're all basically, you know, there's some good people in the company, some bad people in the companies. Um, Mm -hmm. So, the companies don't really view them as a bad customer. They don't have some more years left to them to find the product. And they want to focus on younger customers and trying to get them to uh, that, that, that might be the, you might think that's the case. Um, it, if it is the case, I would just say, well, that's, that, that's, what, they're, that's what they're doing. What, what we would expect them to be trying to make as much money as possible. And, and the issue is uh, not to look into the hearts of the uh, people who are doing various things, uh, but to ask whether imposing liability would accomplish what we want to accomplish. You know, where should we be doing it? And how much liability should we be imposing? And, you know, if one of the significant issues is that young kids don't understand the risk of becoming addicted. If they think that, oh yeah, I can quit, uh, so I'll smoke for five years and then I'll quit. If that's what their mindset is, then maybe the companies should be forced to engage even more than they do in a, a campaign to really make uh, young people believe that they will become addicted. I mean, my own impression from the advertising is it's not very effective, uh, the advertising they're forced to do. So we should just be, we should not be emotional about it, we should be practical and figure out what works. Yes? Um, I'm not really sure what, what you mean when you say what, what line should be drawn. What's, what's an example? For example, it's a sort of time law, and um, he says that by taking this um, time is um, mm -hmm. not going to stop. Okay. Uh, time is law is going to uh, reduce transaction costs, reduce social costs, um, and to um, increment the welfare of society. Justice is not done to the victim as an individual. So, is there a kind of Well, <coughs> from, from an economic standpoint, everything is sort of a balancing. Uh, so, you would, yeah, if uh, I mean, take a person who's robbed a store. Uh, if we punish the person, that person's going to suffer, especially if the person goes to jail. Uh, on the other hand, if we punish the person, it will be in the newspaper. Others will read about it. Maybe somebody who is thinking about engaging in a robbery will not do it. So there, there really has to be a comparison in some sense of the suffering of the person who would be put in jail with the effect of this practice of, of putting people in jail. So uh, in, in a sense, I think what I've been talking about all along is that kind of um, balancing, although I wasn't usually talking about the harm to the person who is penalized, but that's implicitly 
uh, part of it. So there's no, I don't think there's any answer to your question, but for this is a very general answer. So it, you know, in a specific situation, who knows? It really depends on the character of the situation. I mean, one example would be, take a person who is either insane when, when the person murders somebody or was emotionally upset. The person, like uh, a parent, comes in and sees another adult hitting their child. So then the parent goes up to that adult and strikes him and turns out to kill him. Um, almost for sure, courts would impose a much lighter punishment on this parent than on somebody who plans to murder somebody for, for economic gain. And one way of explaining that is that you could say in both cases the, the harm to the person, were the person punished for, for murder, would be roughly the same. They're both going to go to jail, let's say. But the benefit of, of punishing the person who was in an insane rage is very slight. Because if you're a parent and you're living in a world in which you're going to be punished uh, you know, in one way versus another for protecting your child, it's not going to make much difference because your whole instinct is to protect the child. So in terms of you know, the trade-off, I think you, you, you can sort of see by thinking about the way the law actually works. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand this is probably the way the law works. That Trade-offs are being made which are consistent with the economic uh, thinking, even though they're not phrased that way. I think maybe it's, it's time, right? We're, we're, we're going to be right on schedule. Uh, okay. Professor Chevelle, thank you very, very much for coming again. We really appreciate the talk, and uh, we hope to see you again soon.